You're listening to Audio Mag, Magazines Canada's podcast. I'm Kylie Pohl, Manager of Member Services and Benefits at Magazines Canada, and I'm happy to share with you this special episode of Audio Mag. In part one of this two-part series, we discuss how different sectors of the magazine industry are responding and working through COVID-19 restrictions. We understand that this pandemic has brought unprecedented disruptions to the economy and daily life, and we hope to answer some of your pressing needs with these short interviews. Our producer, Michael Brown, conducted the interviews and he joins me now to give us some insight. And as we are recording remotely, please forgive any disruptions in audio quality. As this is an evolving situation, Magazines Canada will continue to update you as best that we can through our social media channels, e-newsletters, and member bulletins. Hi, Michael. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Kylie. Glad to be here. I'm uh, excited to kind of share what we've done over the last few weeks, which is a a series of interviews. Um, Our first one of which was with Melissa Summerfield, who's the VP of Publishing for Newcom Media Inc. Um, And she's been in the field of business to business publishing for over 30 years. So um, she's going to kind of provide some insight on... um, where things are at in the B2B scape in terms of all of this stuff and working remote. And um, I think that listeners are going to find this like uh, very interesting. So I think we're going to throw to that now. All right. So we are now here with Melissa Summerfield, VP Publishing for Newcom Media. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. So... How has COVID-19 impacted your publishing schedule? I mean, has it? Uh, Yes, uh, it certainly has. Um, And because at Newcom, we have a variety of industry sectors that we serve, it has been somewhat dependent by group. Um, So, for example, in the dental group, Uh, We have taken our July and August issues and combined them into one issue. Um, At this point, we are hopeful that by the fall, we'll be able to go back to individual issues as scheduled. For some of our other groups, like supply chain and trucking, we have done some restructuring uh, of those groups, and we have done combined issues for the remainder of the year. Um, That just is sort of meeting the the realities of demand for print at this point in time. And obviously that can change should the demand pick up significantly. But at this point, yes, we are looking for those groups that doing combined issues for the remainder of the year. We've also taken some products that were initially scheduled to be print uh, and moving to a digital platform. So, for example, the May issue of Oral Hygiene, which goes to dental hygienists across Canada, that ended up being done uh, rather than a print edition as a digital-only uh, publication um, because, again, the revenue that was there just simply did not support the, the cost of printing and mailing the issue. And, again, the plan is or hope is that with the fall and dental offices are reopened and hopefully the economy is doing better, that we will then once again return to a print format. Hmm. Yeah, that makes uh, total sense. I mean, I believe there was news yesterday that dental offices are finally allowed to slowly reopen. So that's good. And hopefully that allows for, for, you know, that next issue to (laughs) be in print again. (laughs) Absolutely. So what measures are Newcom taking to ensure that business can continue as smoothly as possible? Well, we, uh, we had everybody set up to work from home as of uh, May, uh, March 16th, sorry. Uh, we had had a management meeting the week before that with the management team, uh, sort of looking at, okay, what do we do, you know, assuming this comes to pass, which looks quite likely. Uh, And certainly for some of our our employees, uh, editorial sales, these are people that are are used to working from the road, are far more equipped, shall we say, to work remotely. So the bigger challenge was with, you know, administrative, production, art, financial. These are people that are usually in their offices. 
and it simply wasn't feasible to start ordering, you know, 50 new laptops and get everything installed in a weekend. So in some cases, that meant sending people home with their desktops. Um, and, uh, you know, that morning, we were, we'd asked everybody to come in that morning of Monday, March 16th. We made sure that everybody had what they needed. We had ordered uh, range extenders where necessary or plug-ins for people. Uh, we had carpools so that people or were sending people with Uber because, of course, we weren't going to ask people to take a desktop on CCC. Uh, but pretty much we had, you know, everybody out of the office. I guess Joe and I left about 2.30 that day and looked at each other and went, I guess we've done all we can. Yeah. And it's it's been amazing, actually, how well we have continued to, to function. Um, and things are continuing to run smoothly. Again, with business to business, we, we, our printers have been, been great partners with us and worked with us uh, to a really, really great extent to be able to keep the, the information flowing uh, to our readers um, in the various industries and sectors that we serve. So we certainly appreciate all that they have done. And I think, you know, I've been impressed by by how much the team members have just stepped up to the plate and, and accepted that they need to keep doing, you know, what they were doing, uh, albeit in a, a somewhat different fashion. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, which leads into my next question. So how has your day to day changed with COVID-19 and the social distancing measures? <laughs> Uh, well, I was always very much an office person, uh, so I was very used to, you know, being out the door at 7 and heading over to the office. Um, so I tried to, to maintain that routine, except now that by 8 a.m. I've gone to the dining room um, because that's become my new office space. Um, but, yeah, I basically try to sort of keep myself on a schedule where I'm in front of my computer by, you know, 8.15, 8.30. Um, and, you know, just pretty much treat it like a work day. Um, but it is a little bit harder, obviously. Uh, you miss sort of that camaraderie or the ability to, to talk to other people. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, I would have been doing a lot of traveling in, in March and April and May, and that, of course, came to an abrupt halt. Uh, my last trip was in fact uh, March 7th to 9th to the Pacific Dental Conference in Vancouver. And in fact, there were some cases of COVID-19 that were reported from that meeting uh, after we got home. Uh, so uh, none of us who were at the meeting got ill, but there was in fact one dentist who did die uh, uh, from COVID-19 after that meeting. So yeah, I mean, it's been a, a you know an impact obviously on the routine, but I I think as much as possible, I just try to sort of keep that same mindset. Uh, I guess one thing that I find harder is that you know I'll I'll walk by the dining room at nine o'clock and I'll still pop in and and check my check my computer because it's still on. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing is kind of finding that divide or or um, uh, creating a, a distinct end to the workday. Yes, very much so. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's hard. And I, I don't think I'm alone in that. I think most people that divide or that sort of, you know, they always have that work-life balance. And I think that's kind of been shot somewhat because your work life is your life right now. <laughs> so is that the biggest challenge or what would you say has been the biggest challenge in moving your work and also your team remote? I think that's certainly been one of the, the challenges. Um, the other thing, yeah, or, or I guess the other challenge perhaps, or, or two of them, um, things that you could do in a matter of a few minutes if you were in the office talking face-to-face, -face, you could resolve it in probably three, four minutes. Now suddenly it's 30 emails back and forth. Uh, so I find... Sometimes the smallest things just take a lot longer to resolve or manage than they do when you can simply discuss them or talk them out face to face. Um, we've also had a new managing editor move on to the dental magazine. So that's really hard because for somebody that's never done the job before, and again, you're not there to walk them through it and work them with them directly. 
So trying to do that from a distance is, I would say, certainly challenging. Um, and keeping keeping people's spirits motivated, especially salespeople. You know, it's no secret that obviously this has been a time where we've seen an unprecedented drop in uh, advertising revenues. Uh, a lot of ad plans have been put on hold. And as salespeople, we all thrive on yeses, and we're hearing an awful lot of no's these days. So trying to keep people motivated, trying to to keep a positive outlook, even though you're hearing a lot of negativity. Um, so that can be a challenge. And as I say, missing that spirit of, of camaraderie or, or of opportunities to collaborate in person. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that uh, there will be a um, kind of consistent um, upswing again, or do you see this as kind of long term, uh, like you were mentioning in terms of the ad sales and the impact? Um, what do you think is kind of the, the outlook there? Well, I know what I'd like to be. <laughs> um, again, I think it's going to be very industry specific. Um, I certainly don't, my personal opinion is I don't think we're going to see a return to levels that we saw pre-COVID. So, for example, I can speak most directly to the dental group. You know, we had had a record year last year. We, at the beginning of this year, were on track to basically equal that. Um, we've taken a hit, obviously, uh, for, you know, May, June, the summer months. And while I do believe things will pick back up in the fall, I don't believe it will pick up to the same level um, that it was at prior to. Um, obviously, you know, dentists will be operating under restrictions. They won't be able to see as many patients. They're going to have higher operating costs. Uh, trying to get PPE supplied to them. All of these things will impact the practice of dentistry. But I do believe we'll see spending come back, albeit not to the same level as it was before. I think trucking and supply chain may take longer, um, just simply, again, because of the, the slowdowns within the economy as a whole. And then I think events, uh, are a whole other field that I'm probably not even qualified to comment on, and I don't see that coming back perhaps as quickly as hopefully publishing will. Um, I think, I guess I come back to the fact that if you are doing your core job of meeting the information needs of the sector or industry group that you serve, you will see things start to come back, whether you will see more of a move to digital and less money in print. I think that's a very strong possibility, and we're already seeing that to some extent. Um, but I do believe that we will see dollars come back, but not perhaps to the levels that they were before this crisis hit. Mm, and not quite so immediately. It's not going to be just like a bounce down, bounce back up. It might be a slower burn. That, that's my guess. I don't see us going yeah. from say, you know, and I don't say we're at zero right now, but you know, if, if we if we take before COVID as a hundred percent of revenue, and now maybe we've dropped to sixty percent of revenue, I don't think that come September we're going to suddenly be back at a hundred, but we might go from sixty to seventy or seventy five and seventy five to eighty five. I do think it will be gradual. Yes. So, what has surprised you the most about how publishing has changed? Um, probably the, 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 the speed with which it happened and the depth and extent, um, of the changes. I guess part of the problem is we've been through economic crises before, which have impacted advertising, but this is a healthcare crisis that then resulted in an economic crisis. And because of the underlying reasons being so different. Um, that's had much, much greater an impact than I think we would ever have seen before. I mean, certainly I've been in business publishing for well over 30 years, I hate to admit. I've been on the dental book since 1995 uh, and Newcom acquired us in 2015. 
And I mean, nobody remembers a time when dental offices across the country were forced to literally shut down. So you went from 100 to zero in that case, literally overnight mm -hmm. um, with, you know, no dollars coming through the door. So again, it wasn't an economic slowdown. This was a healthcare crisis and everything that has resulted from that crisis is now working its way and has worked its way through the system. So I think none of us were prepared for how quickly this hit, how deeply it went, um, and how much it has changed. I mean, I think there are, you know, businesses that simply will not come out of this crisis. Um, you know, the hospitality, tourism, travel sectors, I think are going to take a long, long time to rebound. Um, so I think that yeah, that's what surprised me the most is I don't think any of us were, or certainly maybe just me, uh, were not prepared for how quickly it hit and how deeply it went. Absolutely. I, it, it really was quite shocking when you think about, um, I know when you were mentioning earlier about March 16th, uh, to me that was like the last day, the, the last fully yeah. pre-COVID day where in the span of that week before, you know, the Friday, there was lots of talk even throughout that week. But then all of a sudden, by the Monday, it was like, and this is the last day, everything is is kind of closing. It was quite, quite shocking and, and interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I remember on March 16th, by about, I guess, 2, 2.30, I sort of walked around the office to see, okay, who's left, who needs help, what do we need to do? And, and as I say, there was pretty much nobody there by then. And we, we did a, a webinar the other day at a Newcom company-wide webinar. We had a clinical psychologist, uh, Barry Pockroy, and he had a, a statement in there, which I, I felt that resonated with me. We preferred the certainty of misery to the misery of uncertainty. And as human beings, that is so true. I can deal with bad news. I'll find a way to cope with it. I'll put a strategy in place. But the not knowing, the uncertainty, I find incredibly difficult to deal with. Absolutely. So, okay, when life returns to, I don't know if it would be a new normal, to a pre-COVID normal, to a whatever it is that might be on the other side, uh, are there lessons and skills that you've gained that you think will carry forward? Yes. Um... I believe I probably took some things for granted. I'm, you know, fortunate enough that, you know, we work with, at a great company. Most of our products that we're working on are in fields where we do have the leading publications. Uh, as I say, Oral Health had had, you know, a, a terrific year in 2019. I didn't see any reason why that wouldn't continue to be the case in 2020. And, of course, that was rudely upended. So I don't think that I can take things for granted. I think we have to understand that life is precarious, uh, economies are precarious, that things can happen that are outside of our control, uh, and that we have to then find strategies and ways to deal with them. I do believe that there will be some new habits. I think people have gotten used to, you know, Zoom meetings and virtual uh, communication to an extent that that will alter the way we do business. So I think that's going to challenge some of our assumptions that we may have made previously about how we did business or how we expected others to do business with us. Um, and hopefully, I'm not sure if my team would agree, hopefully I've gotten slightly more technologically skilled um, and and hopefully I'll keep that skill set when we are back face to face. <laughs> but I do believe that I do believe that still nothing replaces the value of of face to face communications. I think one of the things that gets lost so often is you know body language and facial expressions, and nothing expresses those things better than than in person. Mm, absolutely. You know, I was reading something that was talking about the um, how exhausting uh, video calls can be with a team of people because in person you can read those body language cues a lot easier. Um, whereas with 
you know, a Zoom call or a Teams call, you've got so many faces on screen that you're trying to monitor all of this information all at once and still keep track of what's going on, that it can be very draining and people are frequently just exhausted after, you know, long calls like that. Yeah, it's, it's very hard, and yet they're so important. And mm -hmm. we've tried, you know, during this time, you know, Joe's had, you know, pretty much weekly or every other weekly management meetings with our, our you know, our team. Uh, he's done periodic videos or company-wide messages. Uh, we've done, you know, moved to virtual sales training um, on a monthly basis where we used to have, you know, in-person meetings. So, you know, it's vital to use the tools that, that are at our disposal um, and, and make the most of them. But, yeah, it's still not, a, in my opinion, at least a replacement for the face-to-face. The -face. So what's something you're personally doing to stay positive during this time? Okay, well, the cheap, easy answer is drinking more wine. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely should have bought, yeah. bought, I, I should have bought more LCBO stocks before all this. Um, trying to spend time with my dog because he definitely uh, cheers me up. Uh, in a in a dog's world, this is this has been the best time of all because I'm home and let's play more, Mom. Um, trying to really stay in touch with my team members. Um, because I find when I do and, and we sort of exchange ideas or thoughts or even just have a, a gab staff uh, that, you know, makes me feel better. Um, you know, taking the opportunity to, to do some more reading um, and I sort of deliberately on the weekends try not to read business stuff. Um, so I do try to give myself that, that work-life balance break, if you will. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of great literature out there on, you know, helping businesses rebound and, uh, you know, coming back after a crisis. So, you know, it's a good time to, to read those kinds of, of messages and information. Um, and I guess to try and sometimes put things in perspective. I mean, while I'm having challenges and, and business is tough, I still have my health. Uh, I have my husband, I have my stepchildren, everybody in my circle, fortunately, is, is healthy and safe. Um, and so I have to be positive um, and thankful for that. And just knowing that one day we will get out of this, I won't say we'll go back to normal, but we will have a return to some form of, of, of norm, or normalcy and something that will feel less isolating than we are now. Yeah, what a great note to end that on. Well, thank you, Melissa, so much for speaking with me. I'm sure our listeners have really appreciated this and, um, you know, kind of providing insight into the uh, publishing field and the, the impacts that it's currently going through, and particularly in, in business media. Next, we hear from Jessie Johnson as she discusses her production experience this spring. Jessie Johnson is founder, publisher, editrix in chief of Asparagus Magazine with 14 years experience working across magazines and digital media. Yeah, this is a really cool interview that you're about to hear because um, Jessie's perspective with Asparagus being originally an online magazine and then it does have a print edition, but being something that doesn't have a dedicated office space, they were already in a working from home kind of area. And so their transition into COVID-19 work has been quite interesting. So we'll throw to that now. All right, we are now here with Jesse Johnston, founder, publisher, and editrix-in-chief of Asparagus Magazine. Jesse, thank you for joining me. My pleasure. So, um, I know that Asparagus started as a digital magazine, but under normal circumstances, how often do you produce a physical magazine? Um, so our first year, we put out two issues, and my thinking before the first issue was that we were going to grow to three issues for this year. Uh, by the time we had put out issue number one, I'd already scaled back plans for 2020 to also do just two issues this year. And I had been thinking of going to three for 2021, but again, with all the changes with the pandemic, I'm thinking we may stick to just two issues for one more year going forward, just to let things settle in a bit better. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, certainly <laughs> changed. So how has COVID-19 impacted your production schedule? Did I know you said that um, you've reduced the number of issues, but have you had to postpone an upcoming issue? Um, yes. I mean, postpone feels like a bit of a weird word to use because our schedule wasn't set in stone anyway. You know, we definitely, when we put out our media kit for issue number two, we had a schedule that we thought we were going to work on um, for this year. Uh, but already before the pandemic, it was just feeling a little too ambitious. We were hoping that issue one was going to come out in May. Um, and I'd already kind of adjusted my thinking that like June was really likelier. Um, and so with the pandemic, A, committed wholeheartedly to June as opposed to like May, but maybe June. Um, and have also been really clear in communicating with our advertisers, like we're aiming for June, but it might be July because pandemic. Um, and thankfully, we're a sm small enough magazine that most of our advertisers are on board. Like, of course, they want to connect with our audience, but they're also just like supporters of us. Like, that's why they're already working with us. So they're all pretty understanding and just like, you know, great. Glad you're doing an issue. We'll be happy to have our ad out in the world. Um, whenever that happens. And certainly our readers, they're like, oh, you're making another one? Great. So they don't they don't care. Yeah, absolutely. That's great to hear, though, that the readers are so supportive and even the advertisers. Um, have you found I mean, that if we had more advertisers, we'd probably have more cranky advertisers. So it's kind of a weird problem to have. Like, they're so kind because, you know, they're few and really just are like enthusiasts of the magazine. But on the other hand, kindness is appreciated at this time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so has COVID-19 delayed different parts of the production process? And how have you accounted for that in your timelines? Yeah, I mean, I've certainly had just like, numerous contributors go missing for extended periods who are often like people who we've worked with before and are definitely reliable people, but suddenly, you know, they have their children at home all, t all the time. They're juggling all these different things. And, you know, a deadline just whizzes past them um, that they had every intention of meeting and that normally would have been able to meet. Um, so that's happened a few times. Um, the biggest impact on our timeline this week actually uh, is not pandemic related. My art director's laptop died. Um, so oh, no. <laughs> that's fun. Um, but... Uh, you know, I would say because we're such a small operation, kind of flying by the seat of our pants anyway, our timelines are always aspirational. Um, and my approach to this issue has been very much like asparagus cannot be a source of stress for anyone during the pandemic. Like, it's just not okay. It's not like we're never going to get stressed out about the magazine again, but right now it just can't be. So when things shift, they just shift. You know, our printer is like everyone else. They're just delighted that we are going to send something to them to print at some point. So I just keep them up to date. And our print runs are small enough that we don't really impact um, their scheduling hugely anyway. And I think things are pretty quiet over there right now. So, um, you know, the other side of the coin with the pandemic is, um, you know, Asparagus has always been really committed to paying our contributors, but the magazine doesn't yet pay me. Um, so I work a couple of side jobs um, on top of running the magazine, and I got laid off from all my paying side jobs. Um, so I'm currently sitting at home getting CERB money from the feds, and I get to work full time on the magazine, which I don't normally get to do. So on that level, like the bottleneck that is me in our production schedule is much less bottlenecky um, than I have been in past issues because I actually have the time to do the work in a more timely manner, which sometimes if I have, you know, a busy week at one of my jobs, you know, I'm the problem and I'm not right now. So that's that, a bonus. That's very interesting. Yeah, that's a very good point that uh, you bring up in terms of, I guess, uh, uh, to be able to devote, I guess, that extra time. Um, do you think it's going to um, impact or change things down the line, like, you know, kind of post COVID? Well, I mean... Definitely. I mean, at some point, I'm going to have to go back to earning money. Well, and like, there's a big question mark, like one of the jobs that I have is working at a local theater. That job is not coming back anytime soon. 
Um, and so I am starting to have to think about like, okay, what could I be doing instead to earn money? Um, and I, I'd already been thinking of potentially like making a shift. I've made a really conscious decision for the first couple of years of the magazine, um, to take on work that really used a very different part of my brain from the magazine. Cause I just knew I needed like every publishing brain cell for asparagus. Um, and so hence like working in a theater and I also do some childcare and I've been feeling after the last couple of years, you know, there's still more learning to do, but I have more brain cells available. And so potentially could do, you know, some consulting, some, you know, contract editing, some teaching things that are drawing on that same mental resource. Um, and so that's definitely something that I'm trying to think about doing for me. Um, but those things will again, pull me away from the magazine. And so I'm going to have to juggle, um, you know, who does what and when in order to be able to keep putting the magazine out while my, you know, while my schedule and time commitments change. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so what's, different about going into production during COVID-19 and what's the same? I know you kind of touched on um, your work situation and, and CERB, so obviously that's different, um, mm -hmm. but uh, anything else, uh, whether for you or, or any of the uh, contributors? Um, well, certainly for contributors, any of the contributors we have with children and most of our contributors um, for whatever reason to date, um, have been women. And so we do have, um, a lot of mothers who often because not necessarily because they're mothers, but because they're the freelancer in the family, um, are the ones who are now saddled with a lot of childcare. And so that is a huge change, um, <clears throat> for people whose kids are usually off at school to suddenly still be trying to do, you know, their work and continue with their career, but also have, you know, these kids around at home who need attention and feeding and entertainment and education and all of that. Um, you know, I, another thing that's definitely different is that it is a really hard time for advertisers. So like we do have returning advertisers. Um, but under normal circumstances, I think we also would have had new advertisers and we still have some folks we're in conversation with, um, who are thinking about it, but I think most people are just pinching their pennies right now. Um, and so that's even just thinking about like, okay, we have X number of pages allocated for ads. We may not fill those with ads coming in from outside. So do we potentially, um, one of the things that we have always done is had relationships with festivals here in town. And so often we'll give them a contra ad um, in exchange for having a presence at, at the festival at some point. Well, festivals aren't operating in that same way, but do we maybe still reach out to a festival and give them a contra ad sort of as investment in the future for our relationship? Do we just load the magazine up with house ads? Um, like that's definitely a question that we're wrestling with um, because yeah, people are being very careful about where they're spending um, money right now. And you know, a small print magazine is never anybody's first choice for advertising. I wish that were not the way of the world, but it is. Um, so that's a big change. And then, I mean, I think the other thing is just, we've always tried to be a place that is, you know, flexible and supportive of our contributors and everyone who's working on the magazine. You know, we don't have a lot of money, so we make up for not paying hugely by just like trying to be good people. Um, but I think the limits of our flexibility are definitely being pushed um, to being even more flexible just in this time because everything's so weird. Um, but you know, we're able to do that. So that's good. Yeah, that's great. So, okay. Those are kind of the differences. Is there anything that's still the same going to production and, and, um, COVID? Uh, yes. Editing 20 articles at the same time is hard. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I definitely found myself last week just buried under manuscripts because I had a bunch of revisions come back and a bunch of first drafts come back. And I was like, oh, right. This is what making the magazine is. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't actually think that things are dramatically different for us just because we're still so new that every issue is a bit of a new experience and we're finding our way and we're changing things. Like we, we don't have, 
patterns and habits and timelines that are set in stone, like a lot of more well-established publications would. Um, so in that way, it's easier for us to accommodate this because we're a little bit all over the place anyway. We're definitely still a little bit all over the place. Do you have any advice for trying to balance production and working remotely? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, we're permanently remote, so that's not different um, for us at all. We all work from our homes. Um, and so in that way, uh, again, we're kind of well set up for this situation. Uh, definitely make sure you have tools that you trust and feel comfortable with. Um, if you don't love a tool that you're using, I think it's worth taking the time to you know, research the alternatives rather than just banging your head against a wall every day. Like if you don't have a chat client that works well, if you don't have file sharing um, that you feel really comfortable with, like working remotely, those friction points be generate a lot more friction. Um, so I think definitely, you know, making sure that you have the software that facilitates it is important. Um, and I think, you know, communication is just key. And so, you know, we all work on the magazine, but also on other things. And we have a Slack channel and we just keep it open And if we're working on asparagus stuff. And we're not necessarily all in there at the same time, but if you have a thought for someone and you can just throw it in there and you know that someone else, when they log on, they'll be able to respond you know, rather than waiting for that perfect moment to have that conversation. You know, if you're used to being in an office and being able to just like walk by and have that chat, you can't necessarily do that, but you can still find ways to just keep talking to each other because that's really, that's what's critical if you're not in the same place to make sure that you're touching base and on the same page and know what's going on with your colleagues. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what are some of those tools that, uh, you mentioned Slack. Um, are there any yes. other tools that you would that you would recommend that have worked well for Asparagus? Yeah, I mean, so what works well for us is we have Slack. Um, we use Dropbox for um, like our design files, and so we actually like we have one InDesign file. I mean, we back it up like crazy all over town, um, but we have one main InDesign file that um, both the art director and our associate designer and I can open at various times to take a look and see what's going on and tweak things. Um, and that's generally worked just fine. Um, and then, you know, I don't think that video conferencing is necessary for everything. I think people have really like taken zoom to a level that is perhaps more zooming than any of us needs, but sometimes it's nice, you know, especially if you have, you know, three or more people having a conversation, being able to see each other can just facilitate that. Um, so for that, we use Google meet. Um, which is also good. And, you know, and if someone doesn't feel like being on video that day, they just call in from their phone or they call in without video and, you know, no pressure. But if, if we feel like seeing each other's faces, we can. And I think that helps with the distance too. What I haven't figured out, this is not to do with tools, but anyway, you can put it somewhere in the interview. We feel like what I haven't figured out is what we're going to do for proofing. Because normally we have a big old proofing party where I get a bunch of sushi and the whole team and my parents all come over. We just have like pieces of paper flying around the house. Well, that's clearly not going to happen. Um, so we'll probably have to do that on PDF, which sounds way less fun. Yeah, that is um, not going to be nearly as fun. But definitely not. Well, I'll probably print the whole thing out um, and take a copy over to my parents because they're exceptional proofreaders. And I, I learned my lesson uh, from the first issue where I brought them their copy, they were not involved in proofing the first issue. And my father had found three typos within 10 minutes. And I was like, that's it. You are never seeing it for the first time coming from the printers ever again. Um, Got to use those eyeballs early. So they might get a printout, but I think the rest of us will just be doing PDF stuff. Yeah, makes sense. So what's something that you're personally doing to stay positive during this time? gardening mm, nice and cooking i i've just become a hardcore homemaker which i mean i already i already i already loved gardening and i already loved cooking but i had a lot less time for them and i have a lot more time for them now um and they definitely both help keep me grounded and you know i think it's just really easy to stay in the present when you're doing those things and i think you know, what's scary and hard right now is looking past the end of your nose, which we all have to do 
to the best of our abilities, but it's nice to be able to just pull back in and be in the moment and then have something delicious to eat or beautiful to look at or smell at the end of it. Absolutely. I've gotten into doing like some, some balcony gardening uh, <laughs> here. So that's been nice too, because it just at least does liven up, you know, what you're looking outside at for a lot of the time. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. Uh, you know, I'm sure our listeners will find this very informative and, and interesting to hear the different ways in which, um, you know, production has and hasn't been impacted in some of the tools that you mentioned as well. My pleasure. Thanks so much for including me. And finally, we're really pleased to hear from Michelle Gerard as she chats to us about owning and running a retail store during COVID-19. Michelle owns and runs Atlantic News in Halifax. Atlantic News is Halifax's original newsstand and carries a wide variety of Canadian magazines. I think that this interview people are going to find really fun. Michelle was great to have a chat with, and I found it very interesting to hear from the retail side of things and seeing as both Kylie and myself are based in Ontario and Ontario is in a bit of a different position than Nova Scotia, um, hearing how things have opened up and what her experience has been like throughout um, is really cool. And I think that it will... uh, provide some really good insight regardless of where you are in the magazine industry. And now we are here with Michelle Gerard. Uh, She owns and runs Atlantic News in Halifax. Michelle, thanks so much for being here with me. My pleasure. So to get us started, can you just share a bit of background about yourself and Atlantic News? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, Atlantic News actually just celebrated its 47th year in business. Um, There have been two owners. My husband and I, we co-own the business together, and we actually bought it from the original owners um, 22 years ago. And we are a, well, a lot of places, a lot of people in the city call us an institution. Um, For a, a business to be around for nearly 50 years is a very long time. But for business in print, um, certainly under the last you know fifteen years, it's uh, it's quite exceptional. Absolutely, yeah, it's it's terrific that uh, the business has been open for so long and that you've been running mm-hmm. it for for so long as well. It's uh, really a testament, I suppose. Yeah, we've actually been here for twenty seven. Uh, we actually worked for the uh, original owner for uh, several years before we. Before we took the business over together, so it's been um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a huge challenge, um, but it has been incredibly rewarding. That's great. So, what made you decide to stay open during the closures surrounding COVID nineteen? Oh, it was really simple. I mean, I we actually reached out to two, two reasons. One, we are a convenience store as well. A small portion of our store is, is set aside for our neighborhood, um, so that was that was of importance. But of course, what better thing to have during a, you know lockdown um, than um, you know printed material? Um, you know, magazines are an absolute you know bonus because we can't spend our whole day on um, on uh, our iPads or, you know, laptops or our phones. The other thing, though, too, is as as the newsstand, we actually bring in um, 430 copies of The Globe and Mail from Toronto. We actually have it. It's flown down here every Saturday. So um, we actually supply our customers with The Globe, and they come to the store to pick up their Saturday edition. So between essentially The Globe and Mail, The New York Times, um, our magazines, and then our convenience store, it was it was you know it was really of paramount to stay open. Absolutely, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty terrific. So, do you have a lot of people coming in? We do. I, it, I mean, it's been really interesting. So, um, yeah, never closed. We we changed our hours. Obviously, we were open um, thirteen hours a day, and we've moved to you know from to ten to six, which has been great. So the volume obviously isn't there with the amount of people walking through the door uh, at any one time because um, the day that the state of emergency was declared in Nova Scotia, our staff that were on immediately just said, okay, two people are allowed in the store um, because there was three staff members on. And um, so we've only been letting two people in at a time the whole way through up until probably last week when we changed it to three people. And um, 
and, and for the comfort of our staff, for the comfort of our and safety of of the uh, the customers, of course. So it's been it's not it's not huge numbers, but it's very steady. So mm-hmm. we're we're just you know very rarely is there someone not waiting to come in, or that there's no one in the store at all. Now it has slowed down a little bit as things begin to open up, but for those. Well, March and April, April and May, um, being one of the few places that you could actually go to in the city, um, it was uh, it was very steady and, and quite busy. Oh, well, that's that's good news. So, um, do you find uh, our our at least during COVID, have a lot of your customers kind of come in, know exactly what they're looking for, or do you still find people who are browsing, or how how has that worked? We've definitely noticed a difference. So, so no, originally um, it was very much get in and get out, um, know what they wanted, a um, lot of phone calls. Um, can you please bring this out to my car? Or we offered, can we bring this? We can bring it out to your car for you. Um, so they knew, they definitely knew what they were looking for. I would say, um, and that was again the whole way through. You know, the second week. Second, last two weeks of March, April, and May, it was very much, know what I'm looking for, do you have it, uh, can I come and get it, what's the deal, how do I get in, and and so on and so forth. In the last two and a half weeks, we're starting to see people browsing again, um, and uh, it's it's that process is interesting. I mean, we also sell an awful lot of um, art cards. I do a lot of curation of art cards around across the province and across the country, and um, I had a woman recently say, are you, are you, you don't have as many cards as you, you normally do. And, um, and I said, you're right, I don't. And so I thought, aha, so our browsers are starting to come back. So um, it, is, it is an interesting process that, that the, the, the way people were shopping um, previously um, and uh, stuff. So one of the things, though, that we sold an awful lot of, um, again, in those two and a half months was a lot of jigsaw puzzles. Um, and that was a little bit more of a browsing feature, mm. but it was a pretty still a very quick transition. Oh, yeah, there's one, two, three. Yeah, I'll take exactly. those three. Exactly, right. Yeah, yeah. The, the puzzle where you look at it, you go, okay, I like that image. Oh, that's the number yeah. of pieces I want. So you're, you're yeah. browsing exactly. slightly, but you're not like, oh, this magazine looks so interesting. Let me just give yeah. that a read. Absolutely. Exactly. Oh, what, what, what are the articles in this month's, you know, Matt? Yeah, exactly. There, there wasn't that um, and, uh, and stuff. So, but it's, it's now slowly coming back. That's nice. great. So what safety measures have you implemented? So it's interesting that whole process, you know, right from the get go, it's kind of like, okay, what do I need to do? What do I need to do this? What do I need to do that? And anticipating and, and um, so first, one of the first things we did was um, we have a debit machine that didn't have tap. Um, and we thought, oh, you know what, we need to eat the extra expense of um, having tap in the store. So we reached out to them to say, look, can you p- we please be changed over? But we have one question and you need to confirm this for us, which is um, about uh, stolen credit cards, which people do use in our store because we do sell tobacco. And um, so they said, oh, no, if somebody uses a stolen credit card, you will get the charge back. And we're like, okay, so we can't do tap. So because of that, um, but even before, so it, 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 it kind of confirmed every single customer that walks through the store, we ask them to please use a hand sanitizer because um, – one, we did want to allow people to continue to browse if that was their choice when they walked in. Um, and two, because we knew that we had a, a, tap, a, a debit machine that they were going to have to hold, that it was really important that, um, you know, between us cleaning it, that, that they started off essentially fresh, that anybody that was walking in here um, was, um, you know, had clean hands. So um, hand sanitizer has been big. Um, the amount of people in the store has been um, the other one. We also installed... Um, uh, shields at the counters. We put tables in in front of the counters so that people couldn't come to us. Now, actually, because of it, we are going to actually take these, you know, um, essentially jury rigged solutions and we're building in. I actually had a my uh, carpenter in yesterday and he's going to build in new sort of sort of uh, table areas, not a table, but a, a shelf that people can put their magazines down on and, and, um, or their product and whatever, and but they can't get as close to the cash. So shields, um, shelving to keep people away. You know the the lines in the the um, lines in the store saying please stand here. Um, we even because people 
Unfortunately, I still feel that people aren't taking responsibility for making sure that they are aware of what's going on around them, um, that, uh, you know, we, we, we constantly have to say, oh, excuse me, can you just stand behind that white line so that you're six feet away from the customer at the store, at the cash? And, and so we installed a big sign up hanging above it saying, please line up up here. Um, but again, people are uh, not... Um, they're just their their awareness is is not where it should be, and uh, at times. So so there have been a number of things we put in place, but we constantly, on a daily basis, have to remind people over and over and over and over again, mm, yeah. and uh, and stuff. So that's actually been really um, tiring. It's probably probably the most tiring part because we do, you know, we do want people to be able to be comfortable and safe in here. And um, so, you know, making sure that not, you know, and people will just walk through the door. They'll just come on in and they'll just keep walking. It's like, excuse me, excuse me, we have two people in here already or we have three people in here already. I'd like you to wait outside. So there's still that there's a, there's a real education mm. that um, that that I think that um, customers in general, wherever they go, are not um, either absorbing, taking on or being responsible for. And uh and that's and that's too bad. But I mean, those are the things that we've put in place to keep everybody as you know healthy as we can. So, absolutely. So, for listeners who uh, might be outside of Nova Scotia, can you, um, mm-hmm. I guess, provide a little bit of an update in terms of uh, what what the uh, openings or restrictions may or may not be in Nova Scotia at this time? But kind of based on what you were just sure. talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's. Um, Last Friday on June 5th, um, shops were allowed to reopen. Um, they are, you know, things like uh, hair salons and barbers and retailers. And everyone is slow, but, but so long as, so the rule is, is that, you know, if you are, you have to have social distancing information, uh, physical distancing um, information in your store. You have to be set up for that. Ideally, you have your shields in front of you. Um, and most places are ha- have already been doing it, or the you know the shops that are now reopening. Like a lot of the restaurants, they just became tape tape takeout, um, and you could, but you could still physically walk into the building sometimes and pick your stuff up and leave. But they so they were already um, underway. But you know like we've been checking with a lot of retailers um, in the last week, just seeing what kind of hours other people are are running into because uh, people are you know asking us oh what when's your uh, you're going back to your normal hours and we're saying no we're not not currently we're going to stay with a 10 to 6 and um, so many many businesses that we've noticed um, are 11 to 7 10 to 6 closed on Sundays or 12 to 5 on Sundays so really a lot of Uh, Grocery stores are closing at 9, not 11 o'clock, not 24 hours. Um, Bars apparently will be allowed to reopen. Restaurants are allowed to dine in. But if you're dining in, you have to be from the same family bubble. So we're allowed two families to be in the same family bubble here. Mm -hmm. Um, It was lovely to have my daughter walk in today Um, and uh, and stuff. So uh, if you're going out, you have to be with, you're supposed to be with your family bubble. So otherwise, if you're not from the same household or in a family bubble, you are not supposed to be sitting unless you're sitting six feet away from people. So, you know, if you're a party of five and, you know, that's not supposed to be allowed to happen. Um, and it's going to be hard, I think, to um, – no, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. Hey, anyway, I think it's going to be hard on a lot of people to, to A, to, to follow that, and I think it's going to be hard on restaurants to, you know – air quote police that um and and navigate that um Mm -hmm. but you know at least it's we do have movement there is you know there is the signs of people out and about um which is which is lovely um you know there's a little bit more energy on the street some of our major streets we've added uh, the city has chosen to add bollards and um safety cones and and barriers so that they've actually taken away parking so that there's more space for people to actually be out on their bicycles or to walk, um, which is great. Uh, There was a lot of cyclists um, for those two months. Uh, We actually had a lot of our Golden Mail customers would ride up in their bicycles because we were actually doing it at our back door so that they weren't even coming into the shop. Oh, wow. Um, Right? 
which is a lot of fun. Um, cause, you know, a lot of people didn't even know we had a back door. And so we, you know, literally it was a back door pick- pickup and people would drive in, they'd walk in, we'd pass it to them in their car and away they'd go because they were all prepaid. Um, so those 430 people are subscribers with us and uh, stuff. So that was great. So, so there's definitely, you know, there's, there's energy. Um, but I, I think that the, again, the consumer, whether it's to a restaurant or a retailer, to a barbershop, you know, we're, we're still, I think a lot of people, because they were inside and not understanding what it means to be outside, there is a real, there, there, we've been doing this for two and a half months now. And I think mm. there's, you know, <clears throat> for the businesses that are going to be opening, there's a real shift to, oh, right, yeah, okay, there's this, consumers need to be aware of what's expected of them. And some just aren't doing that. Yeah, so absolutely. In that sense, it's it's going to be a challenge, I think, for places across the country as they slowly reopen. So, but it say, is nice to see people out and about and starting to you know go places. So that's really positive. Absolutely. So, save for obviously um, uh, some of the I guess issues or or having to remind people, um, which is mm-hmm. obviously you know frustrating and and everything. Uh, has there been a lot of support from your community? Oh, it's been marvelous. I mean, I, I will say, uh, again, apart from those few that you know have turned around and left because they can't be bothered or whatever the case, it has been uh, overwhelming. Actually, how supportive. First of all, you know, like there's a whole bunch of comments. I'm so glad you're open. Thanks so much for being open. Thank God you're here. Um, but you know, with the um, the Globe and Mail in particular, we have gotten. I don't know how many bottles of wine, freshly baked goods, like, you know, regularly, letters of thanks, um, lovely, these lovely cards, like people have have really made an effort because to them, the print is so valuable. And, um, you know, and I, I'm, 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 it just makes me smile. You know, when I think of some of them, like they're just so, they're so positive and they're so enthusiastic and they love the shop. Um, but then, you know, it could be my neighbor next door that's coming in for his, you know, also for his two liter Coke. They have been so appreciative. Every time I got one, like every time he goes, oh, thank you so much for being open. And it's just, you know, it's been rewarding being here, but that side of it is also just, it's, it's been real. It's been rewarding. It's been, it's been, it also is, you know, it it kind of it sort of negates the, the the ones that are that it, that is frustrating, so um, that people are appreciative and that people are aware of that it has been difficult mm-hmm. for everybody. Uh, so, but yeah, definitely supportive. That's terrific. So, has COVID nineteen impacted your business plans for the future? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, it it yes and no. Since it disrupted my, hmm, let me think about that for a second. Yep. I guess what I would say is that it's not business as usual because we're doing things differently, but it is business as, as usual in the sense that there's not going to be a significant change. I'm not online. Um, you know, we've done quite well having not been online. Um, we've done quite well because we've been open in the sense that, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't impacted our sales greatly. Um, but I do feel that, that there's so many touch points that people expect now um, for a way of getting in touch with a business. And I'm, I do wonder if, if, you know, I, I may be missing out, but we were actually so busy because we actually, we were actually supplying a, um, and still are um, supplying um, an offshore oil rig. Um, so as their crew gets brought in with a chartered flight, they have to isolate in a hotel for 14 days before they can go out to the rig. So every week we've actually been sending the magazines and for six weeks we were sending them daily newspapers. Um, so, so it was, it was busy, like really busy. Yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. And, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so in that sense, you know, back to the original question, I, I do wonder you know, what long-term impact this will have on the industry in general. You know, we are now starting to see the disruption um, when it comes to actual magazines making it to the shop. 
you know, there have been a lot of, oh, there's still May on the shelf. Hmm, okay, where's June's? And then we're finding out that either the publisher has chosen not to print or the publisher has chosen to consolidate issues or the supplier has asked to, can you please hold off? Because a lot of our newsstands are actually closed, um, such as airports, Mm -hmm. Um, right? It's a huge volume of business. So we are now beginning to start, and I have literally around the shop, there's a number of little notes Oh, uh, Jazz Times Magazine. We've missed X, you know, March, Junes, and Julys, and now we're going to be, you know, not seeing until um, until uh, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But it, 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 so the impact is now. So that makes me question our suppliers and their long term and how the this period. Because of course it all trickles down. You know, like you know, the publisher hasn't sold this or hasn't produced it or produced it, and you know has a, a large amount of returns. So it's 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 going to be interesting. We are soldiering on. We have every intention of soldiering on, um, and um, you know, but you know, figuring out we'll, we'll we'll adapt as we go, and and that's all that's all we can do. So so yes, um, some changes in plans. And no, not changes in, in in other ways. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> yes, you know, that, that absolutely does. So what's something okay. that you're personally doing to stay positive during this time? Uh, getting out in my garden. I'm really lucky. Um, I, I uh, don't get out in it as much as I would like, um, but I, I'm... Um, I'm outside when I can be. Uh, I'm reading. I'm trying to read. Sometimes I fall asleep because I'm so tired. Um, but because of our early morning, or actually their late morning starts, my husband and I, before we come to work, actually sit down on the sofa. Um, he's actually doing a crossword puzzle, and I'm reading magazines. And um, because it's it's the amount of time that I have, you know, I can read an article or two, and uh, and I have my cup of tea. And and then we you know then we come to work so so that that's been something quite precious um, and I'm I'm very grateful for 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 being able to do that but I, I, in one way I would probably say above all it's that morning routine where we take some time just to sit quietly and and uh, you know read and uh, and then start our day so yeah terrific well Michelle thank you so much for being here with me. Absolutely. My pleasure indeed, Michael. Thanks for listening, and thank you again to Melissa Summerfield, Jesse Johnson, and Michelle Gerard for joining us today. Be sure to check out Part 2 to hear from James Anderson, Jocelyn Bell, and Julia Metro about their experience during COVID-19. Stay tuned for Part 2, which will be released on June 24th. Thanks, Michael, for stopping by for a chat. Oh, yeah, no, this is great. And I hope everybody listens to part two, because there's some great interviews there as well with lots of different insights. So thanks for having me, Kylie. No problem. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review Audio Mag on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow Magazines Canada on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at Mags Canada and on LinkedIn as Magazines Canada for more magazine news and resources. Audio Mag is a Magazines Canada podcast produced by Messenger Bag Media. We recognize the funding of the Canadian Department of Heritage through the Canada Periodical Fund.